I like how I left all my stuff over there. Is anything, is that I don't think anybody's sitting here. I think all the thing. I don't know. I'm gonna find out. I just it seemed like everyone was moving back and forth. So. Right. Let me grab my stuff. I guess. Wi-Fi for this place that we were given? You can come out this way. It's, I can move. I'm so fat. Look at it. It's so light. That's why I do it. That's why I do it. Tori, hang on one I can sit by you, huh? Well, I just want to see how much. I feel like the closer I get, the worse. I think this is probably the best. Yeah, I think this is probably the best spot for me. <laughs> I'm not sure if everyone's on. Go for it now. Are we live? They'll let you know. And then we just gotta be really apologetic. Let me know if we're live. Hey, you. good to see you too. How you been? I'm okay. I'm just trying to get the good seats, you know. Yeah. They keep moving me around, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to be strong. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm good. Um, just checking it out. I don't really need any politicians. Oh, I know. I was like, they got They got me to show up. I know. You know, yeah. pretty big deal, really. Oh, nicely done. Well, they're coming. Well, Williamson said they were down. Like, you know. Yeah, Warren says. Warren says they're gonna. Oh, hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome. I didn't realize we're, we're live now. It's very exciting. You, you want to talk about where we're at? Anybody want to talk about where we're at? I, I said, I, never mind. I got to tell people. I'll just tell people where we're at. So we're at the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum in Sioux City, Iowa. It is 2019. It is Monday, August, is it 19th? 20th? Where, where are we? Anyways, it's a, it's, it's a uh, historical moment. All the questions are going to be put forth by Indian Country to the presidential candidates. All presidential candidates were invited, including uh, the Republican ones. None of those folks showed up. A few of the Democrats showed up, I think nine in total. We just heard Williamson, Marianne Williamson speak, uh, who basically said uh, they were going to give back the Black Hills. And you can just go. It's, I'm not going to stop, so there's no point, you know, just do your thing. Um, uh, they give back the Black Hills. They're going to make a Department of Peace. And what else? She basically has agreed that uh, Native American folks should have a voice in American politics and teach American politics like what they should be doing to sort of like right the wrongs of all the broken treaties. Also, if you're just joining us now, this sort of forum is going to be used to teach the United States about what is going on in Indian country. So all of the questions, again, you just missed it. Uh, but all these seats were filled with different representatives from different tribes, different Native orgs, uh, Indigenous orgs, Native American orgs, uh, who are asking Wilmington questions. And that's going to be the format the whole time. So next we have another, I think we have uh, Elizabeth Warren coming up next, who will be speaking about, you know, basically answering questions from all of these folks. Right. So thanks for joining. Historic event never happened before. We figured it would be important to come here. Uh, me, personally, um, I'm indigenous. I have been covering a lot of things in uh, Native American issues, and this is going to be all about Native American issues. So here we are. Uh, thanks for joining us. I am Lorenzo, your host, and we're going to stay live throughout the whole thing. If I get any closer, it's going to be worse. But what's going to happen now is someone's going to sit right here, and then that's just to be ahead. But it's okay. So yeah, so this is going to be a forum. So if you're expecting some sort of like sprinty experience, you're wrong. We're going to be sitting still for hours listening. So this, I'll be able to watch the chat. I'll be able to like answer some questions. 
but we're not moving very much. So let's get comfortable. If you're watching, let's know that there's not going to be a lot of movement. I will eventually go into the lobby. We'll hopefully talk to some folks about why they're here. We'll look around. There's a lot of pipeline fighters here. You can see Joy Bronze over here in the corner. Uh, who's been doing a lot of work against the Keystone XL and also a lot of different pipelines, a lot of work on Staple. Uh, there's a lot of people here who want to ask questions about that. A lot of the candidates have kind of laid out that they're going to, like uh, Williamson said they revoke permits. Uh, Elizabeth Warren said they would revo revoke uh, DAPL permits and um, Keystone XL permits. And the reason being because there wasn't uh, pre prior and informed consent, uh, which violates all the treaties. Really straightforward stuff. If you like the rule of law, it's all written down. Um, but they have made new ones to oversee those rules, I guess. It does say that treaty law is the rule of the land and the Constitution, usually brought up a lot. So we're going to see how this goes. I have a feeling that people are going to be sitting right here and it's not going to be as awesome as I think it is. But right now we're doing pretty good. Again, we are a uh, 501c3 educational nonprofit. Thanks a lot for your support. We figured this would be really important to bring for you for educational purposes. Again, it's the first ever historical Native American presidential forum. We're here live. Like, nope. No, I just got to talk. I'm just talking right now because I can. Yeah. Eventually, I won't be able to talk because they'll be talking. Yeah. No. no. Be yeah. Right now. I'm going to do this one. This is going to work. It's all going to work out great. All right. So we are going gonna to sit here. This is it. This is the good seat. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. I am totally live. I see that. Thanks a lot. We have uh, John Z in the back end there, running the back end. Uh, we also doing a little bit of tweets on the Twitter. So if you go on Twitter, you'll see that I'll be updating that feed as well with just some information. You can see people are really excited. And so, yeah, I'm going to the crowd that's gathering. So this is the Orpheum Theater. Unicorn Riot was here before. I want to announce that. Unicorn Riot was here. Uh, during uh, our coverage of the, uh, the Dapple, uh, the Lumineers decided to throw a fundraiser and gave us some of the funds they played here. You know that? This one's those travel leaders. The sign's up now. Oh, this one is? Well, I'll... We're going to find... It's the only one to move forward. To fill up. I'm just going to stay here. It feels good. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren. Senator Elizabeth Warren is going to be coming up next. Again, they'll be answering questions uh, particularly directed at about Indian country. And so again, uh, not huge in the going to events like this, but again, this is a historic event. We're here. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. If you have questions, drop them in the chat. I'll look it up. I'm supposed to not talk. The person next to me keeps looking at me, but I'm going to keep talking until I can. This is Sioux City, Iowa. Right? August 19th. So, just so you know, if you're watching, you're like super interested in this. Uh, we are going to be here today and tomorrow. The event goes for two days. Tomorrow, Bernie Sanders will be here. Today, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren's going to be here along with some other folks whose names have just eluded me, but we're going to hear them all anyway. So let's stay there, get comfy. Uh, and again, the share and like the feed. We don't pay right, for commercials. So here we go. We will begin the next panel in five minutes. That's good. In five minutes. Please take your seats so that we can begin promptly at 10.05. All right, so we have five so minutes. So please, help. Those of you in the back, please try to move forward. Thank you so much. All right, so we have five minutes. I mean, shouldn't have gone live right away. So again, if I had, hello, if I had like the information I would read it to you, actually, I will look it up and then read it to you. So that you know where we're at here. Oh yeah.
experience. I'm going to read you all this information. We have five minutes, so I figured it'd be really good for you to hear it. Again, we are at the Native American Presidential Forum. Uh, it's, it's like the first ever in history, so that's why we're here. It's a coalition of national organizations representing and advocating for Native Americans have announced that this forum is going to happen. Uh, and Sioux City was chosen as the site of the nation's first ever Native American presidential forum, focusing entirely on issues of national concern to first Americans. Ford Directions Inc., a nonprofit working to bring equality to the ballot box in Indian country, is leading the effort. The forum will be called the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum in honor of Native American civil rights leader and champion of Four Directions, Frank Lemire. Lemire was involved in the very beginnings of Four Directions and was a true fighter of civil rights in Indian country. Frank passed away in June. So the panels, there, each panel will be moderated by Mark Trahant. Trahant is a member of the Shoshone Ban Banach tribe and editor of Indian Country Today based in Washington, D.C. He's not on the stage right now, we'll point him out. He is a respected voice and a, uh, for Native people as well, versed in the many Native cultures. Uh, panelists will consist, and the panels, again, this is a forum, so like the panelists will consist of male and female tribal leader, tribal members, and plus Native American youth. In addition to the panel will be Marcel Labu. Labu is a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and a 99-year-old veteran of the U.S. Army Corps. During World War II, a recipient of the French Legion of Honor for her role in liberating France from Nazi control. The Blue will be on hand to ask each candidate their views on the H.R. 3467 that removed the Stain Act, a historical, historic legislation recently introduced to rescind the 20 medals of honor given to the murders of Wounded Knee Massacre. So, yeah, so that's one of the, the focuses is trying to get those uh, medals rescinded. Uh, if we don't know about the Wounded Knee Massacre, we're going to learn about it, so I'm not going to try to tell you all to... But yes, there's a lot more information out there. Again, we're gonna stay alive here. Thanks for joining us. Here we go. Special person that to introduce the next presidential candidate. The person I'm introducing is the daughter of a military family. A military family that served with honor for several decades. She's a single mother that lived paycheck to paycheck while at the same time going to college and getting a graduate degree from the University of New Mexico. This woman also became her own businesswoman, was successful in achieving what all of us aspire to do. And in 2000, in the last election, she made history where she became one of the first Native American women to be elected to the United States Congress. An enrolled member of the Laguna Pueblo, it's an honor to introduce to you Congresswoman Deb Holland from the first District of New Mexico. Today, we are on Indian land, and 
and I thank the ancestors for giving me the space to speak here today. Before I begin my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge that two years ago today, on August 19th, Savannah LaFontaine Greywind disappeared without a trace, and her body was discovered eight days later. The media didn't re timely report on her disappearance, but today there is an army of us to talk about her and all our sisters whose lives we want to protect. I am deeply grateful for Four Directions, OJ and Barb Siemens, and the Native Organizers Alliance, and all for hosting this important Native Presidential Forum. I acknowledge and thank all of our veterans who are also here with us today. We have come so far together, and I know it didn't happen overnight. Many of you have worked very hard for a very long time, and we've had so many people on the ground advocating, engaging in the political process, and fighting for our right to vote. Thank you for paving the way for us. Doing this type of work takes a great amount of sacrifice, and I truly commend you for stepping up to make your communities better. I want to pay tribute to the Lemire family. Thank you for sharing him with us. I know Frank would have been proud of this immense undertaking for presidential candidates to focus on Indian country. I look forward to being part of this his honoring celebration at the Democratic National Committee later this week. Thank you also to the Winnebago Tribe and Chairman Frank White for being here to honor Frank. Many of us would not be here if not for him. I'm in my first eight months of Congress and it seems like a lifetime. It has been an eventful, sometimes overwhelming, yet privileged experience. When my sister representative Sharice Davids from Kansas' 3rd District and I became the first two Native women ever elected to Congress, we both felt change immediately. I was the first Native woman to preside over the House floor. For the first time, the Native caucus <laughs> For the first time, the Native American caucus is chaired and co-chaired solely by Native Americans. And we have taken every single opportunity to bring tribal leaders and Native advocates to the table. My colleagues are reaching out to learn about the challenges Indian tribes face and engage with our office regularly. We also work with the many longtime congressional allies like Betty McCollum from Minnesota and Gwen Moore from Wisconsin that Indian country has had for a long time, and I'm grateful for that also. As you know, so many issues in Indian country need the attention and focus of the Congress. I've been working in the areas of education, health care, infrastructure, economic development, self-governance, and protecting our land and environment and fighting climate change. Last month, as Vice Chair of the House Natural Resources Committee, I defended our Chaco Canyon Bill that will create permanent protections and argued fervently with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle about oil and gas interests that want to drill and extract on my Pueblo ancestral homelands. The same is true for protecting Bears Ears, Grand Staircase Escalante, also ancestral homelands of the Pueblo Indians. I will always lend my voice to protect our sacred lands, address climate change, and move renewable energy forward so we can pass on the gifts of our indigenous land to all future generations. Part of this effort through the Native Incubators Act will give entrepreneurs in Indian country support through grant funding to ensure economic success. Because when everyone is successful, everyone is successful. Yes. That sounds pretty easy, right? It's not that easy uh, when half of our country doesn't have broadband internet. So those are all the things that I want, that I'm working on that I believe will move our communities forward.
forward. Part of this, recently I joined in introducing the bipartisan Remove the Stain Act. The bill rescinds 20 medals of honor that were awarded to members of the U.S. 7th Cavalry after the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890. one of the darkest days in our nation's history. The introduction of this bill shows the continued work and strength of Native American people who have fought for more than a century for the United States to acknowledge genocidal chapters of our people's history. During our press conference to announce the legislation, we were joined by descendants of the victims of this massacre. Leading sponsor of the bill and my good friend and colleague, Representative Denny Heck, said the slaughter of innocence is not an act of valor. We must remove the stain of the Wounded Knee Massacre from the Medal of Honor's valued legacy. With the help of four directions and all of you, I hope we can move this and other legislation forward in Congress because the healing of past wrongs is critical to us finding peace and moving forward. As you all know, the, the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women has been a silent crisis for far too long. Now that Native communities are finding their voice and power, we're raising this issue every chance we get so that our mothers, daughters, and sisters stop disappearing without a trace and without justice. one of my top priorities since before I was sworn into office. I was also fortunate to have the support of my colleagues in passing two amendments included in the Violence Against Women Act that passed the House. The amendments expand the tribal access data program on tribal lands for increased data sharing among tribal law enforcement departments and will provide funding to Native American victims in urban areas. VAWA now sits on the desk of Moscow Mitch. Along with many bipartisan bills, the U.S. House has passed, which make up McConnell's legislative graveyard. And if there's something that you think you should do, because look, the Violence Against Women Act, don't you think people would want to pass that <laughs> bill and get it signed by the president? Yeah. office, he would answer his voicemails probably full. If you tried to email him, you probably don't have the right zip code unless you live in Kentucky. So I would say just write him a snail mail letter, send it in the mail, make sure he hears from Indian country about why we think the Violence Against Women Act needs to be put on the floor of the Senate, passed by the Senate, and signed by the President. Yes. Moscow Mitch has turned our our, our three-part governmental system into two because he doesn't he won't put anything on the floor that he says the president won't sign and that's just not the way it works we're the legislators it's, it's up to us to move legislation sponsor of savannah's act which i hope will move soon Last, I plan to introduce the House Companion to the Badges Act, which seeks to address the federal inefficiencies impacting BIA law enforcement, recruitment, and retention efforts that are prevalent across the country. The Badges Act will work to increase the effectiveness of federal missing persons resources and allocate funding to tribes and states to coordinate response efforts for the missing and murdered indigenous women cases. These bills are all important important steps to moving toward combating the overwhelming number of domestic violence cases and gender-based crimes in Indian country. It will help move tribes toward true self-governance because tribes know what is best for their own communities and their own people. <coughs> I'll continue to build strong relationships to indigenize Congress by finding support on bills that will keep our people safe and build stronger communities. Because Indian country has gone far too long with scarce resources 
and it's time for our people to have the same opportunities at finding success in not only public safety, but education, housing, economic development, and health care. And that is why last Friday was a monumental day when Senator Elizabeth Warren and I announced our legislative proposal and comment period for the Honoring Promises to Native Nations Act. A comprehensive and long overdue piece of legislation to address the chronic underfunding in Indian country that is highlighted, highlighted in the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Broken Promises Report. The Broken Promises Report, which came out last December, I believe, put it bluntly. Quote, the United States expects all nations to live up to their treaty obligations, and it should live up to its own. Yes. taking action. Native American communities have long endured a history of oppression, broken treaties, and misleading double talk by those in power. From blankets laced in disease, to times when our grandparents were put into boarding schools, to our land being sliced and diced during the allotment era, to the unrelenting efforts to assimilate us into mainstream society. Through it all, the federal government has failed to live up to its trust responsibility to Native nations. It has failed to provide foundational support in exchange for the land that made our United States of America. Our legislation will give Congress the opportunity to address the long-standing failures of the federal government. Our proposal offers a number of provisions to reaffirm the government-to-government -government relationship between the federal government and tribal nations, and to properly fund the federal programs that support the social and economic well-being of tribal communities. We ask tribes to share their feedback on important issues such as how best to achieve budgetary certainty and transparency for Native programs, increase tribal representation in the executive branch, require meaningful and timely tribal consultation by the federal government and improve self-governance and self-determination. I hope you'll join Senator Warren and I in developing this important effort. The boldest and most, legis the most just legislation yet to address the promises that have been broken and the need in our communities. Look, it's not lost on me the need to elect more Native Americans to public office. Shout out to Emerge Iowa. I am a graduate of Emerge New Mexico. Emerge America is a national program, a democratic woman, a democratic women's leadership, political leadership training program that trains women to run and win. And I just want to make sure that any of you who might be thinking that it's time to run for office, that you step up and you make that step to have a voice in our communities. We need people at all levels. School board, city council, county commissions, state senate, state uh, house, Congress, president, someday. <laughs> right? And I, 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 I always use Ruth as an example because she, it seemed like she was approaching insurmountable odds, but if you watched her Facebook page throughout her campaign and all the sneakers that she wore out and showed us the bottoms of her shoes, uh, that she had been knocking on doors for hours and hours every single day. That is what it takes. It's a lot of hard work. But look, we can think about all the best ideas right here in this room, and unless there are people in leadership positions and decision-making positions to carry those out, we don't move forward. So I want you all to think seriously about your part in moving our communities forward, not only in running for office, but getting our people out to vote. I started out as an organizer in Indian country, and it was the most rewarding and fulfilling thing I have ever done. 
knocking on doors in Indian communities all over New Mexico to make sure that those folks got out to vote. So I want you to think about that seriously. We have an obligation to ensure that the best people are getting elected, people who, are, who will move our communities forward. So um, I'm gonna do something a little different right now. I feel like this is my one opportunity to sit with you all, and I wonder if anybody might have a question to ask me while I am sitting here right now. <coughs> Anyone? Yes. So uh, I grew up on the Roseside Reservation during the, um, the uh, uprising on Pine Ridge. So we had a lot of FBI and uh, military coming through my reservation. I want to know what we can do to change the perception that Indian protests are not patriotic, that we can support Native peoples in their plight. Right. Yes, I've heard this is a trend across the country. They're, they, they're trying to actually infringe on people's constitutional rights from protesting. But you know what? Our right to protest is embedded in, in the Constitution. And that's what I mean about running for office. When you, when you have a voice in any state legislature or in a state or in a city council or a county commission, you can advocate for our right to protest. And it's not lost on me that we didn't draw the boundaries to our lands. So, right? And so, thank you, Ryan. So, when, when we are working to, just because our sacred sites aren't within the boundaries of our land doesn't mean that they cease to be our sacred sites. And it's our obligation to protect those sites. The same way that I am, working hard to protect Chaco Canyon from fracking and drilling, you all have a right to protect your sacred lakes and rivers and mountains and various other lands where your people have prayed for centuries. So that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. You can clap for that. Hey, thanks for joining us here in Sioux City, Iowa, for the first ever presidential so forum. I'd like to hear that talking about our voices need to be heard in every single level of government and um, you can bet that if any bill like that tries to come across the house floor then I'll be the first one to speak up against it because that is our right it's not only our right it's our obligation it are, it, it's our obligation to fight for those things anyone else I'll take one more yes Stacy Bowler from the National Indian Health Board I am inspired every time I hear you say it is time for you to run for Congress. I think there are people in this room who probably would want to take that step. What's the first thing we should do to get going? The first thing you should, if you live in Iowa, I think you should apply to Emerge Iowa. Get some training. Look, it's, everyone needs to get involved. I got involved. I started out as a phone volunteer and now I'm a member of Congress. I'm, uh, that's the honest to God truth. Because, yeah. I, I wanted more Indians to vote. That was my mission in life for close to 20 years. I, I would go into campaign offices of candidates who I liked and ask for a list of Native Americans. And I would call those people and ask them to get out and vote. That turned into me uh, actually uh, going to Emerge New Mexico uh, it turned into me uh, being a full-time volunteer for President Obama's 2008 campaign. It turned into me being the uh, state Native American vote director for President Obama's campaign in 2012. So I want you all to get involved. I want you to start as a phone volunteer if you've never been involved in politics before and just make that move forward. Thank you so much.
graciousness in giving me this opportunity to update you on my work in Congress. I'm honored and privileged to represent the First District of New Mexico and thrilled to work in giving all tribes a seat at the table. My door is always open to you. I'd like to now transition to putting on my organizer hat. You may know that I have worked on campaigns for several decades, during which time I dedicated much of my organizing career to getting out the native vote through phone calls, door knocking, and building trust for our party in Indian communities across my state. Considering that this 2020 election is the most important election of our lifetime, and I know that we say that every single year, but this truly is, we must win the White House if we intend to protect our democracy and our environment even into the near future. I decided to be bold and to put all of my experience and heart behind a candidate who I feel has the intelligence, the experience, the energy, enthusiasm, and the heart to win this election for working families, for students, for people of color, for our LGBTQ community, for teachers and veterans, for Indian country, and everyone who has been sidelined by this administration. Let me share with you about my decision to endorse Elizabeth Warren for president. <laughs> for the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to get to know Senator Warren personally. We have spoken often about the needs in Indian country, and she has taken action legislatively. She personally helped me get elected to Congress. We've worked together to introduce legislation calling for universal child care and pre-K and for suitable housing for our families. I've seen her up close conversing with tribal leaders and tribal youth, listening and asking the questions that move deep thought and ideas forward. Elizabeth's just released truly bold tribal plan is one that will give all tribes the executive attention they need and deserve and will move forward all the legislation I just talked about and more. But beyond all the great policy plans and intentions, we share perspectives in how we look at the world. We both come from humble beginnings and found success through hard work and perseverance. We both were single moms and we understand what it means to live paycheck to paycheck, struggling to make ends meet. And as a former state party chair, I know a winning candidate when I see one. One of my favorite things about Senator Warren is her ability to explain complicated plans and concepts into language that all of us can understand. She is genuine and warm, and she makes every moment count in her fight for working families. Some media folks have asked me whether the president's criticisms of her regarding her ancestral background will hamper her ability to convey a clear campaign message. I say that every time they ask about Elizabeth's family, instead of the issues of vital importance to Indian country, they feed the president's racism. Elizabeth knows she will be attacked, but she's here to be an unwavering partner in our struggle, because that is what a leader does. The president who worships Andrew Jackson, who coddles white supremacists and defends Vladimir Putin, who cages children and freely admitted to assaulting women, is no match for a woman with a plan.
introduce the amazing, the unstoppable, my sister in the struggle, Senator Elizabeth Warren. <laughs>
Well, it's a, a special day, I feel. I just got a hug from the next president of the United States. Now, Senator, this uh, uh, pertains to law enforcement. The Senate Indian Affairs Committee has repeatedly documented that our on-reservation law enforcement is and has long been in crisis. Virtually all Western reservations where the criminal jurisdiction is exclusively federal and, and tribal operate with less than 60% of the officers that the federal government's own studies show are necessary. We also have detention facilities that are in such bad condition Unreliable leads, water, air conditioning, bad ventilation, and cracky walls and leaky roofs. That they would not be allowed to operate anywhere else in the country. What steps are you prepared to take to address this crisis? So, thank you very much for the question. I see this as having two parts to it. I think there is a sovereignty and respect part to this, and there's also just a plain old money part to it. We have got to be willing to put the resources in so that the tribal nations are able to keep their citizens safe. Yes. We just must. What I'd like to see us do is reverse Oliphant. I want to see the tribal nations able to protect all people on their territories, and that means jurisdiction over both tribal citizens and non-tribal citizens. And then we need to be willing to put the money in so the system works. It's not enough just to acknowledge sovereignty. We've got to put resources behind it so that law enforcement has what it needs to be able to get the job done so that the judicial system has what it needs to be able to operate the courts. So I see this as moving forward on both grounds. It's the importance of our recognizing the sovereignty of the tribal nations and the nation-to-nation -nation relationship between the federal government and the tribal nations and it's about putting the money in to honor our trust and treaty obligations. Thank you, Senator Warren. I especially appreciated your um, platform on what you're going to do. It seems you really have the pulse on Native Americans and the necessary things that we need in order to exercise our sovereignty within our respective nations. I also appreciate the fact that you said that you were going to appoint somebody to come and um, deal directly with Native Americans because as a tribal leader it's extremely frustrating as we navigate every cycle of um, elections. It's as Native Americans you oftentimes have to go in and educate uh, new administrations around the issues that relate to Native Americans and the unique uh, sovereign status that they share and the government to government relationship that they do. My question is about for the criminal justice and policing, and you spoke of it earlier in the recognition of missing and murdered indigenous um, people, women. And I don't want to sort of belabor over it, but some of the statistics according to the United States Department of Justice are that American Indian women are 10 times more likely to be murdered than the national average, and also four in five American Indian women will experience violence in their lifetimes. And homicide is the third leading cause of death for American Indian girls between the ages of 10 and 24. And as you've spoken of earlier, the crisis has been long a quiet one. And we as indigenous women and children have become virtually um, invisible within the landscape of America. So my question is, is as it relates to those things, um, as federal authorities quite honestly um, fail to really accurately report those things and work to not only um, advocate on their behalf and seek justice for those women and those and resources. As the President of the United States, how would you enjoin not only yourself but your administration and your authority to address the missing and murdered indigenous women in a crisis in the Indian country? So, thank you for the question. This comes on the day that is two years to the day, I believe, that Savannah was taken. And 
But when I first got to Congress, uh, the Violence Against Women Act was out for reauthorization. And I was one of the strong supporters of expanding VAWA to include indigenous women and specific provisions and specific resources for that. As you know, though, that bill has now been allowed to lapse. This is something we've got to be pushing back on and make sure that it has adequate and expanded protection over where we got it the last time. The other part, though, that I, I very much hear you talking about is the invisibility of the problem. That um, over and over, I'm struck by women who go missing and it doesn't make a headline for a week, for a month. Women who are murdered, Native women, and it never makes a headline. A problem that is not seen is a problem that is not fixed. So I think of this in two ways. One is the importance of the federal government getting serious about collecting data and making those data publicly available. Yes. People need to know the scope of this problem. But the other part is to go back to the issue about tribal sovereignty, about all of them, why it is that we need the tribal nations on the front lines, adequately resourced so that they can provide the first line of defense. It is powerfully important that people who are of the community, people who know, are right there to provide the safety and the security that our women, our children, our men need. So I think it's both that we go for and that we start now by raising this issue every day. And I just want to say again, you were kind enough to say thank you to me. I want to say thank you again to Deb Holland as we, her work in this area has been extraordinary. And she has forced our conference to address the issues. I 
but expect more excitement from our native citizens. Woo! Where is your destination? Where are you headed, to, Mrs. Warren? To the White House. <laughs> Good land. Yes. And you'll be headed there soon in the near future, the Democratic National Convention, to have good discussions and good conversations. And we hope that you take our message with you and promote it on the national platform. The very question that I ask as a tribal leader in my own tribe is that who will protect, defend, honor, and enhance the best interests this country's native citizens. Because you know what? We deserve it. And the United States government is obligated. Yes. Thanks everyone for joining us. This is Nigel Dana Point. I'm your host today. We're going to be live uh, hopefully all day. This country would like to talk about reconstruction. Reconstruction. Because as we stand now, $2.5 billion is what the annual budget is for the Bureau of Indian Affairs to be distributed among 573 federally recognized tribes. That is unacceptable and shameful. And we have let this country's native people down. We owe so much to our elders, our predecessors, our current generation, and future generations of the Harvard University, which you're all familiar with. <laughs> George C. Marshall spoke in Harvard, and he said at one time during that speech, our policy is not directed against any country, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. How many Native Americans face that at your reservations? Raise your hand. How many of these things sound familiar to you? Again, it's extremely shameful. In 1948, the United States implemented the Marshall Plan. The plan was in effect until 1951. Over the course of this period, including aid provided prior to the start of the Marshall Plan, the U.S. invested just shy of $1 trillion in current dollar value in economic and technical assistance to European nations post the damage caused during the war. While these efforts addressed post-war recovery, they equally included efforts to modernize European infrastructure. And the efforts served to create an atmosphere of hope that would lead to greater strength and prosperity. Mrs. Warren, you have spoken passionately about the issues of reparations and how it is a moral imperative However, to date, none of the 2020 candidates have raised the issue of reconstruction for Indian country. The United States commits billions of dollars to reconstruction in countries it has waged war upon. The last being Afghanistan and Iraq. In respect to military conflict, the United States was engaged with the great Sioux Nation for 36 years, twice as long as the current conflict in Afghanistan. That is but one example of many. The economies and vital infrastructure of tribal nations subject to war with the U.S. were either destroyed or devastated. And yet not one dollar has been invested in reconstruction of these tribal nations by the U.S. As president, would you commit to a reconstruction program to rebuild Indian country and redress a historical wrong? So, thank you for the question, and thank you for the way you frame this. You know, I look at this as, show me your budget, and I'll tell you your values. Where a country spends its money tells you what that country values. One of the reasons that Deb and I put right at the heart of our plan is full funding for infrastructure, for education, for health, 
on our tribal lands is that we understand that until the United States honors its already existing trust and treaty obligations, that we cannot have the kind of prosperity among the tribal nations that they deserve. So we start there, and I think what I would like to see, and I hope, I hope this is the right way to think about it, and I, we've stayed very open and textured in how we've, we've addressed our plan. We've not yet gone to statutory language because we invite much more conversation from our tribal leaders, from the intertribal organizations, uh, from experts and young people who want to come in and tell us about different parts of the language. But here's where I'd like to start. I would like to start with the United States government honoring its current trust and treaty obligations in the world. If I can, I just want to add one more small point because it's something else that Deb and I have worked on together. And that is about bigger programs and plans that will reach a lot of people. They're not specific to Indian country, but would have a profound effect. I proposed a tax, a two cent tax, on the greatest fortunes in this country. It's a wealth tax, the top one tenth of one percent. <laughs> and with that two cents, we can fund childcare for every baby in this country age zero to five. That means money straight down into our tribal nations to be able to offer this care for every one of their children, paid for by the federal government. Universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old in this country, raising the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher in this country. These are the things we do and should be doing together. And I'll just add, because it gives you an idea of how distorted our economy has come, become that same two cents will not only do all of that for our babies, it will permit us to provide technical school, community college, four-year college, all of our tribal colleges, tuition-free, expand the Pell Grants for the people who most need them, put $50 billion into our historically black colleges and universities, minority-serving institutions and tribal colleges, and cancel student loan debt for 95% of the folks who got it. opportunities and also means for people struggling now with student loan debt, we can cancel that student loan debt and that's going to make it easier for a lot of people to be able to move back to the reservation, be able to move back to small towns, rural America. You ought to be able to make it wherever you live in America and part of that is about the United States government honoring its promises. That's where I am on this. I serve as the president of the United Tribes of Michigan, uh, vice president for Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Tribes, and first vice president for the National Congress of American Indians, Woo. in addition to being chairperson of the Sisseguri Tribes of Hawaii. Woo, chairman! I want to thank you. Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you um, immediately after you were elected. Um, you've always been a friend of Indian country, and you came to our NCI executive winter session yes. reception, and I've seen you there every year since. Um, so you have supported Indian country, not just because you're running for uh, election uh, for president, but you've been around um, since you've been uh, elected. So I appreciate that. Thank you for the warm welcome you've always given me. I appreciate it. Um, and so we did, we had a conversation um, at that reception and you told me, I asked you a little bit about your personal history because of the attacks uh, during the campaign by that, uh, that centerfold guy that you run against. And I don't remember his name anymore, Scott Brown or something. And you told me your personal story at a very personal level and, and I, I urged you to tell your story and I appreciate that you did. And um, what I would say is 
from here forward, because now we're in a presidential election, that we take uh, Michelle Obama's advice, and when, when he goes low, you go high, and when he attacks in a racist way, disparaging one of our heroes, one of our female Indian hero women in our country, that you take the option not to give any um, credence to his, his racist arguments, but instead, tell us what you're going to do for us. The cabinet position that you've proposed is amazing. That's history in the making. <laughs> President Obama got the ball rolling with the annual Tribal Leader Conference. I would ask that you change the, the Tribal Leader Summit. We have not had one since the current presidents occupied the White House. So I'm, I'm excited about the leadership that you're going to bring to the White House and the government-to-government -government relationship that I know you will institutionalized for tribes. Natural resources extraction on tribal land on treaty lands threaten sacred sites, cultural resources, tribal sovereignty, and the environment. The health of entire tribal community suffers when outside companies extract precious resources from tribal communities and in turn share none of the profits. Uh, tribes are forced to shoulder the risk of the disaster but share none of the wealth. Tribal lands are treated as wastelands for industrial mining, uranium mining, fracking, and pipelines. How will your administration ensure tribal governments are consulted and tribal leaders exercise authority over all natural resource extraction in tribal nations? Thank you, thank you for the question. So let me start by saying tribal governments are the ones who should control what happens on tribal lands. <laughs>
from the White House. There is much, oh, I love saying this, that a president can do by herself. And I commend you to that. But there is also much that we have to work with Congress on. And this is why I'm so excited about the work that I'm doing with Congresswoman Holland and why it's so important that she's there. Undertaking this issue with each of our colleagues, holding them accountable, forcing them to vote over and over and over on issues that address this basic nation-to-nation -nation relationship. I know in particular... Thank you. This is how we work together. <laughs> The importance of land, and the importance of the land as a piece of both autonomy, history, and respect. And so I strongly, we've been in these battles side by side, protect and as president, will protect the, the lands that belong to the tribal nations. Harvey Godwin from Lumbee Tribe. So I'm Harvey Godwin, Chairman of the Lumbee Tribe from North Carolina, and um, it's Southeastern, it's rural, and yeah. And uh, we've been through two hurricanes in the last three years and still recovering from that. And today I'd like to talk to you about something a little bit different. The Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina receives funding through the Native American Housing and self determination Act, known as Nahas under HUD. In 2008, the Housing and Urban Development Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Program was initiated called HUD Bash. The Lumbee Tribe was awarded 20 HUD Bash vouchers as a part of our tribal HUD Bash demonstration program to provide housing to American Indian veterans living in our territory who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. As of today, with the collaboration between the Lumbee Tribe Veterans Affairs Office and the Veterans Administration in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is home to Fort Bragg and the 82nd Airborne, the tribe has housed 20 Lumbee and other native homeless veterans with a waiting list of 22 more. We are awaiting additional vouchers through HUD. So Senator Warren, what can you currently do in Congress, or what would you do as the President of the United States of America to fully fund and push through the Congress the needed funds to ensure that not one Native American is without dignified housing as Native American veterans. Thank you. This question you raise is one that is very close to me personally. All three of my brothers served in the military. My oldest brother was career military. The other two served and then came out and one more construction after. One started a little business when it didn't work out and started another one. My three brothers I'm still very close to, they all live back in Oklahoma now. And I, I don't think there's a phone conversation or visit that goes by that one or the other of them doesn't raise the issue of how our government treats its veterans. Our veterans, our, our military, active duty military, have agreed to lay down their lives for us. Their families sacrifice enormously. I can still remember when I was just a little girl and my mother every day would run to the mailbox to see if there was a letter there from Don Reed, one from John, maybe one from David. And on the days when there were no letters from any of the boys, she'd say, well, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. And on days when there were letters, lit up the family lines, called everybody, read the letter, read it again. She met my daddy at the edge of the front yard, got a letter today from one of the boys. When people sign up for military service and agree to give up so much, that's a sacred promise with the United States government. And that means we have to honor our promises to our veterans, our promises for health care, our promises for education, and our promises for housing. There should be no homeless veterans in this country. None.
I also believe that supporting the tribal nations to be able <coughs> to help with the homeless veteran problem is, is exactly the right way for the federal government to go. But once again, the problem is, it doesn't work if it's all words and no money. You've got to be willing to put real money behind it. I'll keep pushing. I know others in Congress, like Deb, will keep pushing on this. We will keep fighting for this, but I guarantee you this. How we make real change is we get a president who's willing to fight for it, and people across this country who are ready to say it is time for the federal government to do what's right in this country. Amber Torres for Walk River. Me, Amber Torres, me, Nadia, no, a guy, a Good morning, everybody. My name is Amber Torres. I'm the chairman for the Walker River Paiute Tribe in Shores, Nevada, and I thank you for coming this morning. So, the question that I have for you this morning is regarding um, voting rights. Yes. In 2016, Walker River Paiute Tribe and Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe set the standard for equal access to voting rights in the, for our tribal citizens on the reservations in the United States. My question to you will be, if you are elected as the president, how would you ensure that all Native Americans on reservations have the same access without having to litigate? Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's just start with a statement of our values. Voter suppression is democracy suppression, and it must stop. intends to retain power by keeping American citizens from voting is appalling, and we need to be willing to fight back against that in all places where it shows up. It is a special problem, I know, on, uh, uh, on the tribal reservation lands, and in particular, uh, I support both repealing the suppression acts that satellite voting to give more people access. I think this is one of the areas, once again, where it's got to be done in concert. Needs are different in different areas, but the key has to be you've got to be willing to put money behind it. It's not enough simply to say, okay, everybody can do this, but there's no money. So polling places get closed. People can't make it, the distances get further, and the state government that's running it says, gee, we don't have any money to make this happen. So I have, you would be surprised, I got a plan. <laughs> well, I'm making sure that every American citizen gets a chance to vote and get that vote counted. But a big part of it is to set federal standards for access to voting, make sure that those federal standards are appropriate to individual regions and individual locations, and that there's real money to back it up. Voting is the heart of our democracy, and we have got to be willing to protect it as a nation. Thank you. I know Senator Warren has to leave, and uh, please a round of applause for the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Somebody's trying to ask questions in the crowd. You can see those people there. Ah, so the one. 
Again, you that's watching this on the Unicorn Rat, we are live in Sioux City, Iowa for the Native American Presidential Forum 2019. Never happened before. That was Elizabeth Warren. Mary Ann Williamson just spoke before them, or before her. And I think there's a break. Second of it. Uh, Those are my homies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think what to do here. All right, let's give it one second, everybody. Everything's falling apart. All right, everybody, all right. Let's give us one second here. Uh, again, you're watching this on New Point Right. We are in Sioux City, Iowa. I've been alive for a little bit now. I was kind of listening to uh, presidential <laughs> Democrat, well, right now Democratic presidential candidates answer questions that have to particularly do with Indian country. I think there's going to be an announcement right now. What are you guys going to do? Um, hey, I know everybody wants to take a stretch. Uh, we, we may actually, uh, we contacted the DNC and we talked, uh, contacted the RNC. Because what we wanted also to have happen here is to kind of get an idea of how we as Native Americans get into uh, the RNC or the DNC. Uh, I haven't, I, I got a, a denial uh, on one, but we have uh, Ryan Ramirez with the DNC that wants to talk about this. Native Americans and how we start forming our own caucuses. And I'm pretty sure, regardless of uh, what party it is, we can use it on, on either side. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Ryan Ramirez. All right. Thank you, thank you. Uh, meet us here. I'm going to pull up that ball and maybe grab a chair. Can I get um, some um, <laughs> Bonjour, Nishi. Hello, my friends. Um, I'm Ryan Ramirez. And... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair Warren. It's an honor to be here with my friends and family here from Indian Country. And uh, my name, as I said, is Ryan Ramirez. I'm an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians in Belport, North Dakota. Um, my mom's family is from Belport. My uh, father is an enrolled member at Tlaxcoyaki in Southern Arizona. And uh, my wife is from uh, Tahola, Washington, the Quinault Indian Reservation. My kids and my wife are all enrolled in Quinault. I'm also the general counsel for the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation in Connecticut, and I also serve as the chairman of the Democratic National Committee's Native American Caucus. Hey, hey, which, which the late great uh, Frank Lemire was a, uh, was a member, and I'm proudly wearing his shirt here today. Thank you to the four direct directions for organizing this amazing forum. I think we should all be incredibly proud to see the involvement and the work that's going on here today. This is truly, truly um, visionary and something that Frank would be incredibly proud about. You know, uh, Frank dreamed big, had a beautiful heart, and um, I want to thank his family for, for being here and sharing him with us. Sharon is uh, his, his, his beautiful smile and his joyous laugh. Those are some of the, the some of my favorite memories of, of Frank is sitting around talking to him and hearing that laugh and seeing that smile. It's amazing to see natives gathered to engage the presidential candidates. We've never had any kind of forum like this in the past and we should be incredibly proud of the work that we're doing here today. We are the most political people in the country, in my view, amen, uh, because our ancestors had to fight so hard in order for our overall civil existence. We had, they had to sacrifice, and our, our communities had to fight to maintain our way of life, our lands, our religions, yeah, yeah. our languages, and our sovereign governments. They fought for the nation-to-nation -nation relationship that we have with the federal government 
And the Father government has a solemn duty to uphold these rights to tribal nations and indigenous people. As Native people, it is on us to stay politically active. It's on us to get involved. It's on us to rise up and fight for a better future for our communities and for our tribal sovereignty. And there was no one who understood this responsibility as much as my friend Frank Lemure. I had the honor of working with Frank on the Native American Caucus, where he helped to give Indian Country a voice in the Democratic Party and to give Indian Country a platform to advance our priorities and our needs. As a civil rights hero, yes, as a civil rights hero, he was more than an advocate, he was more than that, he was a hero to all of us. <clears throat> and a party leader, Frank understood well that we can't be bystanders for things that we must believe in and hold out our government to accord and fight for our native people. As he said best, nothing changes until someone is made to feel uncomfortable. And that, that goes for, that, that really goes on two sides of, of the coin too. It goes in regards to where we personally feel uncomfortable when you see the change in the, in the, the horrible work that's going on that we get inspired to get out there. And it's also when we push others to feel uncomfortable and, and promote that change. I say this because we have a critical decision to make as a country in 2020. And to be blunt, Indian country has a lot to feel uncomfortable about. And this president in our current administration, there's a lot for us to feel uncomfortable about. When an administration talks about rolling back the trust responsibility, we as Native people should all feel uncomfortable and we should rise up and take action. When our president threatens our environment and our sacred sites, we, should, we as Native people should rise up and, and feel uncomfortable and take action. When our government threatens to build a border wall separating indigenous communities, we as Native people need to rise up, be uncomfortable, and take action. When our government does not uphold its obligation to provide adequate health care and education to Native people, we as Native people have to rise up, feel uncomfortable, and we have to stand up and take action. Which is why it will be critical that we are engaged in the, in the election, up and down the ballot in this uh, coming 2020 election. And we have so many amazing candidates running for Democratic nomination. I encourage you to ask what their ideas are in any country. Let's bear with the stuff that's making really go out to the lobby and to look around. Or fighting for missing and burned indigenous women. Our issues are important and our seat at the table is mandatory. As, as, Native, as the Native Caucus, we have pushed candidates to meet with tribal leaders. We've pushed them to develop Indian country platforms and show up in our communities like here today. For example, we just had, uh, at the last debate, we had tribal leader roundtables where we had five candidates come and meet with 20 to 25 to 30 tribal leaders around the table. That included Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, Senator Harris, Mayor Pete and Governor Bullock. That's why I'm so encouraged to see the presidential candidates here. I'm proud to see the good work of Frank carrying on in terms of making these people come out and fight for our votes. Likewise, we should ask those that are attending, why or that aren't attending, why they've chosen not to attend and push them to feel uncomfortable. Those who did not attend need to push or to, to up their game in outreach in Indian Country. I speak with different presidential candidates about Indian Country almost daily at times, and they need to, they need to not only hear from me, but they need to hear from all of you. You all need to get out, and you all need to make our voices for Indian Country heard. With that said, I want to be sure to encourage everybody to get involved, to run for, for office, find a candidate that you believe in, fight for them, and in addition, I would like to ask you all to get out and um, run to be on the DNC in your state parties, run to be a DNC member. We need more Indians in the DNC. Frank would 
wholeheartedly agree with that. He fought for that for a long, long time. And in addition to that, I'd like to see everybody and encourage everybody to get out and run to be at the convention, to be a delegate. So I'd like to encourage everyone throughout this campaign cycle to get out and run for delegate. If you're interested in running for delegate, you're interested in becoming a DNC member, if you're interested in running for office, I'd encourage anybody, everybody to reach out to me. Please feel free to send me an email at DNC Native American Caucus at gmail.com. That's again, DNC Native American Caucus at DNC, or DNC Native American Caucus at gmail.com. Um, it's not some blind place it's gonna end up, you will get a response. It's not a black hole, so please, please use it. With that said, I want to thank everyone for allowing me to speak. Indian country can and will be a powerful voice in this 2020 election. Let's get in the fight and make people feel a little more comfortable. Thank you very much. All right, thank everybody. Much. Thank you all. So we're gonna go into the lobby. It looks like there's gonna be a little bit of a break, so we're gonna see if we can talk to some folks in the lobby what this is like, and then, uh, yeah. We'll just be here for the next couple days, so if you keep following our feeds, Unicorn Riot, you will get some updates from here. We'll keep bringing you a live feed if folks want it. Looks like folks enjoy in the feed. And here is the lobby. So again, we're in the Orpheum Theater. Hello, hello. It's really pretty. Oh, I said it's really pretty, the theater. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So we got a chance. Switch I'm gonna go outside and then try to walk back in, maybe. So yeah, so again, let's kind of show you the lobby. Well, I wasn't a driver. Oh, I'm gonna say walk out and then walk back in. All right, yeah, I'm just gonna show outside. All right, so this is the Sioux City, Iowa. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. What up? How's it going? Good to see you. Hello. Hey, good to see you. Hug. This is live and someone else. We're getting, we're getting photos taken. But yeah. Can I do a spiel? Yeah, go ahead. You want to talk about what's going on here? So, hi everybody. My name is Winnie Locke and I'm a part of the Grassroots of Dapple. And I want to give a shout out to Lorenzo and his crew mm -hmm. because they always stood with us and they're all about indigenous rights and they're all about the narrative. And uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to give a special shout out to them. We're actually listening to presidential candidates and how they plan to tackle our issues in indigenous communities from healthcare to education to correctional facilities with jurisdiction and that's what we're just listening to. So we heard, we heard two from so far and we're gonna, we're on a break now and we're gonna come back in at one. Did you hear anything good? Actually I did, I, I, I really liked the first one. And in my honest opinion, I think Deb Holland, who is you know in our Congress now, is doing a phenomenal job. Mm, yeah. A really phenomenal job. So. All right, right on. Are we going to take a picture of you? Yeah. All right, here we go. One, two. Thanks so much. Good to see you. I know. Does anybody else want to talk to you? Think they're all going to be chilling? No. Yeah. Who wants it? Oh, Chairman Frazier. Right, we're, right yeah, we're live right now. Hey, how's it going? Good. Just wanted to say hello. I don't, yeah, I'm around. I'm around still. Did you want to talk about this at all? Or? Yeah, I can talk. Yeah. Whatever. Hey, everybody. Hey, Ron. It's cool. All the original Sacred Soul people are starting to show up. It's awesome. Um, I wish Warren would have talked a little bit more about, about the gun violence. Um, that's, that's just beyond out of control right now. 
Um, I was glad that she said honor the treaties to actually have a presidential candidate with her statue and reach to actually say honor the treaties. That's bringing a whole new level to this, 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 this money, money campaign. She didn't really speak about, about racism and, and, and how that's playing uh, a huge factor in the, in the division of, of so-called America. Um, so those are some things that I wish she would have spoken about. All right. Well, did you, uh, somebody who's been involved in a lot of pipeline fights, did you like at least uh, some of the conversations about the pipelines that you've heard so far? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, she was one of the ones that signed the No KXL Pledge so that that um, she would she would do away with the Keystone XL permit. Along with that, with that denying of the Keystone XL permit is also a provision in the pledge to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. So, yeah, I mean, I would love for, I would love for that to happen. That would make that first night we were all cold worth it. <laughs> Up, you know, it's still worth it. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for talking yeah. to me. And good to see you. It's been a while. All right. I don't know where to go either. No, I agree. I'm okay. I'm, your work and oh, thank you. you do. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, that was real fun. Yeah. That was fun. No, we didn't record any of it. We recently, we. we we're a media team, and then we released our first era documentary. We didn't record any of the premiere. Oh, anyway. wow, wow. <laughs> it was so much fun. Yeah. Yeah, it, was. it was like rocking in there. It was. It was good. All right, well, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to filming this thing. So, but thanks for talking to me. And yeah, I'll see you later. Oh. All right, so uh, we're just talking to a few people out here. I'm going to walk away and then walk in to show you kind of like what... Uh, Kind of where we're at again. This is a Pierce Street, Sixth Street here in uh, Sioux City, Iowa. And they got the Native American Forum. Never happened before. You can see we talked to a few uh, Native folks. Is talking about how good it is to actually hear uh, things that pertain to them. Uh, oh. I'm live. I'm live. Okay, no, I'm live. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Live, brother. Yeah, yeah. Catch up with you. Good to see you. Uh, my name is Lorenzo. I spoke to you a long time ago, and at Pine Ridge, in Pine Ridge during uh, Victory Day before Standing Rock, I spoke to you, and it was really influential. So yeah. we have a video interview of that person talking about water rights. It's an elder from I think the Santee Nation. So it's Chase Iron Eyes. Uh, folks out here. I was kind of looking around trying to get interviews. All right, so we're gonna go back inside. Everyone's kind of talking out here. I don't like, like it really. Don't like interrupting people. That's why I'm not really the best at this, I guess. I was just through, I talked to that guy, but what do you need from me? What do you, you were with him? I'm with the media, yeah. Oh, yeah. I already checked in, so they, they got me. Hello, hello, hello. All right, so this is the lobby, it's very active. There's a lot of folks here, really exciting. And so this is like the break. We just had uh, two presidential candidates, more on the way. Everyone's kind of milling about. I think I'm gonna be live for like the next one, probably. Uh, Next few of them, then we'll, we'll take it down. Let's see if we can talk to anyone. Oh, sorry. Hello. Hello. Good luck. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Other causes. You know, you know we have gays. So that's a presidential candidate for now. Hope country is going to be speaking tomorrow. Right? You speak tomorrow, right? Tomorrow at 11. Right? So tomorrow at 11, we'll hear from him. And then... Uh, I kind of hear everyone a little bit. Alright, 
All right, I'm going to check my phone. I'm going to see one more thing. It's really exciting. There's so much going on. Oh, my gosh. There's so many people. When we first got here, I got here at 7. It was definitely not this full. You can see the Orpheum Theater. It's, well, it's empty out now because everyone's like outside because there's like a break. There's supposed to be some special presentation at 1. Anyways, like I was saying, like the reason this is historic is uh, presidential candidates aren't usually talking about what's going on in Indian country. And so part of the organizing that was going on behind this forum was to get uh, the, the presidential candidates here to talk about issues that particularly have to do with Indian country so Americans can actually hear about what's going on in our United States citizens or people in the United States, people in the world can actually hear what's going on in Indian country from uh, Native folks. And so like all the panelists that we've had are like different... Uh, tribal leaders, different just indigenous youth from different tribes all over the country, uh, posing their questions about what's going on in their territories to like presidential candidates who are then answering them. So we only had two, you know, I guess if you've watched them, you can go back, kind of decide your take on that. I don't know. Again, usually not my beat, but I, again, never happened before. And I think, uh, yeah, it's just important. So it's historic. It's important. We're here. We're live. We're going to keep staying here and be live. So, all right. I'm gonna walk out one more time, so I can get an interview, and then gonna communicate with the studio. We might take it down to one. Uh, is it, that way I can kind of reorientate myself, make some other life decisions here. But this is again gonna be going on for the next two days, today and tomorrow. So just keep bearing with us. We're not we're not going anywhere. And again, like we are a 501c3 educational nonprofit, uh, which is all non-commercial. Uh, thanks to everyone who's donated so far. You made this sort of coverage possible. Uh, please, if you can, consider giving whatever, whatever is possible so we can keep doing this sort of work, this kind of on-the-ground uh, journalism where you get to actually see what's what's happening for yourself. Hey! Yeah, going. All right. I'm on 3, so 3 p.m. Stop by and say, hey. All right, so he's, he's, he wants me to go sit by with him at 3. It's right here at this radio booth. You can see there's a lot of big, big media teams here. Really going. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.